Getting it real with Wong Chun Wai on the hottest topics, frank, engaging, and candid. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Salam bahagia, Malaysia and followers from around the world who are watching Real Chun Wai again. Today we have a very special guest, Professor Dr. Ki Keng Hui from the School of Medicine. Tsinghua University in China. It's a very prestigious uh, university, and we have here a very highly respected scientist. So we are indeed uh, very lucky. Now, um, let's dive straight to the uh, conversation, Professor. Um, for the understanding of the average person, uh, could you tell us uh, what would be your scope of duty in this university? Uh, do you teach, or you do both, or you do research as well? Uh, what is your scope of duty as a professor? Actually, both. I okay. have to teach and I also to do research. So I spend about 40% of my time uh, teaching and mentoring students, mm -hmm. including undergraduate students, graduate students. Yeah. And mostly graduate students. And another 40% of my time, uh, I use them for research. And another 20% will be for public service. I see. Including administrations, reviewing, all this. Right. <laughs> so, so it means um, when you say undergraduate uh, student, uh, what year are they at? So from year one to year four, mm -hmm. uh, uh, freshman to uh, senior. I see. So for the uh, undergraduate. And for graduate student, uh, usually for our major, then would need to spend about five to six years to finish their PhD degree. Okay. So usually the first year we have to teach them and they'll mm -hmm. have to go to class I see. Uh, to learn, right? So those so, are the teaching, class teaching. And besides in class teaching, mm -hmm. I usually do mentoring okay. uh, for my graduate student in the laboratory mm -hmm. yeah, for their PhD project. So do you enjoy doing research more or you enjoy teaching more? Actually, research more than teaching. <laughs> <laughs> As a scientist, <laughs> frankly speaking. Yeah. Uh, Professor, you, you have been uh, teach, uh, working at the uh, uh, Tsinghua University for the last uh, 12 years. But before that, you spent mm. a long time, decades in the US. You were a student at the Iowa State University for your bachelor's and master's degree. <laughs> And then your PhD at Real Cornell Medical College. You were also a research prof associate at Stanford Universities. These are Ivy League uh, colleges, uh, very prestigious. How did you end up in China, in uh, Tsinghua University? Well, uh, if I can go sure. back to the year that I made my decision to uh, come back or go to Tsinghua University, mm -hmm. it's around 2008 to 2009. Mm -hmm. And when I was a research associate at Stanford University. So uh, having have all the trainings in our area of research, and I think that was the time that I need to get independent to build my own team, research okay. team. Okay. Uh, so in the academic path, that's usually the, about the time that uh, we have to uh, apply for position. Uh, I see as a starting principal investigator. Mm -hmm. So uh, in 2009, so I was applying um, for the independent position. So I then I was looking in advertisement uh, in the science magazine, and mm -hmm. I found that Tsinghua University School of Medicine mm -hmm. uh, has some opening for stem cell research. Okay. So I uh, applied for those positions. And then I got in. So <laughs> that's the basic uh, information for my application. In terms of uh, research and uh, working, uh, are there any difference between the American and the Chinese uh, universities? Are there any difference in the way it is done? Conducted? Yeah. Uh, well, for our majors, uh, biological science or biomedical research, mm -hmm. I would say the level of uh, engagement or the level of advance uh, between uh, China and US, they are in many areas pretty much the same. Okay. But the way that the, the mm -hmm. projects are conducted, 
especially for funding, uh, if, we are, if we are talking about funding situation, the way that they organize uh, for research funding is quite different. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, to me, um, in US, there are more independent uh, individual research project that uh, uh, scientists can apply. Uh, and you can explore the um, scientific uh, research by your own plans or uh, your individual uh, thinking. Yeah. Whereas in China, um, major project or major funding, uh, we are talking about uh, about three thirty million project for five years uh, by about uh, uh, five to eight groups of uh, research. Uh, those kind of major funding are usually organized by team. So there are many research team from different university. Okay. We put together a proposal mm -hmm. uh, together. So the whole team would have about 50, uh, sometimes to hundreds of scientists together to mm -hmm. work on a, a big projects. So th those are the one major yeah. difference, I think. Okay. Ah, okay, Professor, now this is the part where I need you to explain in very uh, simple uh, layman language. Uh, you're a medical pers person. You're from the uh, School of Medicine. I come from a background of uh, social science. Okay, <laughs> so it's totally uh, uh, totally different. Now, um, I've been reading uh, what, what you have said. So uh, when we think of stem cell, uh, my layman language is, of course, the average uh, where people go to get um, stem cell uh, treatment. Now, uh, you are doing research in... Uh, uh, stem cells, human stem cells, and germ cell biology. So, uh, can you explain to me what's human stem cells and germ cell biology, and how does it affect the normal average person? Yeah, well, let me yeah explain a bit. Thanks for giving me this opportunity to <laughs> explain. Uh, I think uh, public education uh, to learn more about this uh, scientific project is also important. So, I also do some. Uh, scientific uh, public service uh, to uh, to uh, uh, teach or to uh, give lectures to the public. So let me try to explain uh, <laughs> stem yeah. cell. Uh, so uh, if we follow this area, we know that this uh, kind of special cells has a potential that can develop into about 200 different kind of cells in our body. See. So the first time that we found stem cell in human will be at the embryo stage. So in our mother's uh, uterus. So those at that primitive uh, stage of our development, the cell stage are, uh, has many potential to become all the major cell type in our body, including blood cells, including our neuron cells. So those are the stem cells. Okay. So they have this uh, potential. And they can self-renew in many or many times. So and keep the same properties of the cells. So scientists uh, found that if we took this stem cell and culture them outside of our body in a petri dish, if we can multiply them for many times. Uh, making them from one cell to a thousand or even million cells, then we might have the potential to use them for medical treatment. I see. Especially those diseases like degenerative uh, disease, okay. like Parkinson, Alzheimer, or many, many kinds, spinal cord injury, or all those. So this has a potential to okay. make many uh, medical usage. So then, um, so from the basic research, we would like to use these cells for many uh, medical uses. Then uh, my focus is to differentiate these cells uh, to make them become um, sperm or oocyte to help the patient who are suffering infertilities. Okay. So we know that uh, some of the patient, they have some reproductive issues uh, to have babies. So if we can uh, do this uh, in vitro differentiation, meaning uh, I see. taking the cell outside on the petri dish and maybe uh, developing some treatments, technologies to help them to have artificial uh, uh, 
technology to help them. So those are the technology that we are developing in the lab using this special kind of cells. I, I hope I can expand somehow yeah, I understand. The, yeah. about this. So the only question that came to my mind as you were talking was that uh, when we take these stem cells, uh, do you take it from the men okay. or from the women or both? Uh, actually, this stem cell, uh, what we uh, one of the stem, one kind of stem cell is what we call embryonic stem cell. They came from donated fetus or processes, and uh, we took this inner cell mass and then cultured them in petri dish. So they are at the baby stage. Both female and male cells, we could culture them. But once we have this cell line, we don't have to go back and sacrifice many embryos. If we have one embryos at the beginning, mm -hmm. then we can use the cell line almost forever. If we culture them correctly, then we can use it. So that's the way that we are doing now. And actually, we are using a cell line that uh, was built in 1998 until now. See. Yeah. So, Professor, what is a germ cell biology? Right. Okay. Germ cell. Uh, in terms of germ cell, especially in, when we are talking about human germ cell, we are referring to sperm and uh, eggs for the okay. uh, fertility. Uh, so those are the uh, okay. basic science term. And so when we are talking about research on human germ cell, we are actually referring to okay. reproductive medicine I see. or reproductive biology. It's not the germ that we are uh, okay, usually yeah. use in the sure. common term. Yeah. So those are that those are different. Yeah. So what? Why is it that the scientific community? Why don't they use just uh sperm or cell? Why do they or the egg? Why do they have to use the word uh, germ cell? Why? Any reason? Uh. So uh, this is the basic term that uh developing, uh, or the scientists in the developmental biology is used when they uh, define oh. the terms at the mm. beginning. So okay. then we, uh, because it's already in the textbook uh, from the beginning, then we use this germ cell term. Mm -hmm. And then uh, other uh, discipline also use the term germ See. by mm. itself, which is which has a different meaning. So, okay. uh, so we also actually have more scientific or more specific terms for different kind of uh, germ cell. For example, at the very beginning, mm. germ cell is called primordial germ cell in the early, earlier stage. And then okay. after they uh, develop and differentiate into a uh, later stage, they become sperm or okay. uh, eggs or oocyte. It's more mm. different from the uh, germ cell term that we uh, refer to. Right. So, Professor, your research uh, in uh, in these human embryonic stem cells, uh, why was it necessary uh, for this research to be carried out um, in space uh, when the China's first cargo spacecraft, uh, Tianzhou one, uh, why was it necessary to conduct research uh, in space? Yes, so that's a good question. So, why do we want to do uh, uh, this kind of experiment? It seems that if we might need to spend so much resource uh, to conduct the experiment. Uh, there's one reason is from the uh, scientific uh, goals uh, for us is to study the microgravity effect on uh, the human germ cells. As we know, there are many uh, space projects nowadays. And in the future, uh, or in the near future, there will be more and more people going to space or okay. uh, traveling in space. Uh, I see. So then if the human body uh, under the space uh, for a long time or long duration, we might have, um, we might be harmed by the radiation, by the microgravity or a special kind of physical condition. Uh, to our bodies, to different uh, cell types, including our blood cells, bone, or mm. germ cells, our uh, reproductive cells. So uh, uh, in previous study, usually we have to wait for the astronauts to come back uh, to after their spacecraft or space duty. 
and we can only take some blood sample from or some other measure, which is not invasive. Uh, yeah. So if we have to study the germ cell uh, development directly, especially human germ cells, then we have to have an in vitro system yeah. that we can uh, collect the cells and analyze them at the cellular or molecular level. Then we uh, um, apply uh, for this project and propose this project yeah. to the space uh, projects. Uh, then they, uh, they, uh, they think that this is quite meaningful and important uh, for us to study the uh, okay. germ cell development in space. So then we uh, develop all the system, including the hardware that we can mm. follow the cell morphologies, the chains of morphologies uh, with automated system. Uh, we can take pictures and send them back uh, uh, for us to analyze. We can also collect the cells after certain days and then return them and we can analyze them with the most advanced uh, molecular tools. Yeah. Forgive me if I if I get it wrong. Uh, you mentioned yeah. that uh, at this point that um, um, in the near future or even now, uh, people who travel to space have become more frequent. Um, so in my mind, of yes. course, astronauts and even possibly soon, you will have uh, people who travel yes. to, uh, to space as tourists, as travelers. Um, do scientists right. take it a bit further to think that uh, when you do this research, uh, it's not just for people who will be traveling to space, but could possibly one day um, it would involve people who actually stay in space. Does it include that kind of uh, thinking? Yes, definitely. So it, uh, not only in the space station that we have, uh, for example, China space station, Tiangong, uh, Erhao, now uh, orbiting our Earth, but uh, for the moon's project, uh, they're actually building a moon uh, uh, station. Uh, so if, we, if the astronaut or people that are traveling to moon, I think they will have to stay for a while before they can come back, or even Mars. The Mars project is actually already going and planning uh, yeah. to carry out. So in the future, there will be more and more. Uh, not on, I, I guess in the future, not only the astronaut, even yeah. some uh, uh, tourists, or, yeah. <laughs> right? right? The space tourists, yes. Right. So, so at what point, uh, at what point in your research, when it was felt that uh, it was maybe it's necessary uh, to take this project uh, for research purposes uh, and to conduct this experiment in space. At what point did you went to the uh, space level? Oh, well, this is uh, um, when I was in Tsinghua around 2014. Uh, so what another Tsinghua professor, uh, he already participated in the uh, space project. And uh, we are good friends. And he uh, asked me if they are interested, if I'm interested in uh, participating, mm -hmm. because he's not. Uh, he actually studied bacteria, and I study mm -hmm. human stem cell. So he thought might be uh, someone who are studying stem cell and germ cell could also participate. So he asked me, and I uh, start to think about the project, and I got excited. So I uh, propose uh, the experiment and research project. And then uh, after all these uh, reviews, uh, going through all the review committee, uh, I remember yeah. there was about 1, 000, around 1,000 uh, app applications. And oh. I, we finally got in. Oh. Right. So how long would so, this uh, project last, this research? Actually, yeah. There are multiple stages. So the first mm -hmm. stage, when we apply in 2014, the first launch was in 2017. Uh, so that was the first launch. Uh, so we participate in the Tianzhou Yihao cargo mm -hmm. uh, projects. And uh, this year, we are going to send another uh, set of samples. So they are rolling uh, projects right. ongoing. So we are still participating in this uh, space project. Uh, Professor, you know, this uh, research takes a lot of time, uh, takes a lot of money. Uh, even in the US, if you are doing it for commercial purposes, it takes a lot of time. Uh, sometimes the research may come up with nothing. 
and uh, a lot of patience is needed. So from the Malaysian uh, universities' point of view, um, how what what can Malaysians uh, universities do um, to to be actually to be really involved in uh, research? Uh, uh, what is our level at the Malaysian university, and what can we really do? I did, I guess uh, this has to be uh, dependent on what we really need. And uh, we don't have to do all this uh, space project, I think, uh, as what we have done in uh, China or in US. We have to uh, really seriously think about uh, what Malaysian uh, university want, uh, what kind of long-term interests or uh, for the local uh, research uh, that we really want to carry out. And once we committed to this research, then we can plan uh, yeah. to have a three or five years projects, to have a mission uh, divided by different uh, goals. We don't have to achieve uh, at the highest level uh, in a short time. We can divide them with the limited resource that we have, we uh, we can plan out better and think seriously, plan seriously yeah. before we launch. Uh, we don't have to follow yeah. all the uh, expensive and uh, yeah. projects that require a lot of resource. Yeah. I guess I that one of the reasons, uh, I guess that if, I, if I'm not wrong, I guess one of the reasons why you uh, decide to come back to Asia uh, to teach at the uh, Tsinghua University is probably you want to be nearer to home. Um, how does yes. universities like uh, Hong Kong or Singapore fare in all this um, in comparison to Chinese universities um, in terms of attracting uh, uh, scientists, uh, attracting uh, brains from uh, from America and China to, to be in Hong Kong or Singapore? How do they fare? Yeah, I think, uh, uh, I guess, when you are talking about uh, the... Uh, certain nationalities, when they are going back to their own country, uh, they might have other factors, factor mm. in to make decision yeah. to whether to go go back to certain countries. And I think uh, that will be the, those might be individuals' uh, yeah. uh, decisions. But to me, uh, if, if uh, we take this uh, factor aside and think about the general conditions. Uh, for uh, Malaysian or Singapore uh, to have, uh, frankly speaking, in reality, we, if we have limited resource, yes. again, we have to think about uh, what we really want to do and mm -hmm. what we want to serve. If we want to really serve the local community mm -hmm. and uh, if we want to get closer to our family, then we yeah. can make that decision. Yeah. Uh, so I guess... Uh, what we know, uh, Singapore also have their own direction in yeah. terms of research. They don't really have to follow all the big projects that yeah. are uh, carrying out in US. Yeah. Um, so, Professor, I want to ask you something uh, that's more personal. Um, you grew up, uh, you were born in uh, Perak, and then you grew up in uh, Johor. Am I correct? Yeah, I was born in Stiawan, and oh. actually, uh, I was in a small fisherman village Pantai Ramis. Yeah. And mm. I until I was four. And then I moved to Johor Bahru uh, with my family. I see. Yeah. So So are you a I, Fu Chao? Teo Chiu. I'm a Teo Chiu. Chiu. So you're you're the Teo Chiu or your Fu Chao is a Diawan, right? Teo Chiu <laughs> Teo Chiu <laughs> is the one. They're actually a big community in Teo Chiu too. Uh in Stiawan and uh, Teo Chiu community. So how do you end up in uh, Johor Bahru? How were your parents were um, moved there because of work or anything like that? Uh, because of my uh, grandfather from my mother's side, they have a uh, kopi tiam. Mm. And, uh, we have we were uh, my parents were taking over the kopi tiam. So I mm. actually when I was four, I moved to grew up in the kopi tiam environment in Johor Bahru. In Johor Bahru, yes. So, so does Also this coffee shop still exist? Yes, yes. Yeah. Chang Fa, yes, yes. You, In GB? Uh, that coffee, coffee is actually very close to the Lee Pineapple Factory. 
So okay. there are many uh, workers who are coming to our uh, copy them every day. Which, which part of JB is this? Uh, but uh, Huang Ho, uh, Glang Pata, close to Glang oh, Pata. Okay, Glang Pata. Glang Pata, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. So that was why I read in the star, it says that uh, yeah. you visited your, uh, what do you call it, your family members uh, who's, who uh, still live in Hainan. Oh, yeah. Um, mm. I actually visited them to, uh, in 2017. That was the first time when I uh, went to participate in the launching because mm. the launching site is close to uh, uh, my uh, relative. Yes. I see. Why, why, why is the launching, was, why is the launching pack uh, located in uh, Hainan uh, and not some other parts of uh, China? There are actually multiple uh, launching sites uh, for the space project mm -hmm. and uh, the Hainan is close to, close to the, uh, is uh, one of the convenience spots in terms of weather, in terms of the launching distance to the space station. Uh, that's the idea side. And I see. Uh, to launch a big uh, rocket and that usually uh, launch in Hainan now. I see. So yes. if I want to see an actual launching of the uh, the, the rocket, so Hainan is actually a good okay. place for me because it's very near to, to Malaysia. Uh, and, and the weather yes. is uh, predictable. And also free visa, I think, for Hainan. Starting uh, soon. For Malaysia visa. Soon. Yes. Yes. Soon. Yes, so, yes. So how, how would I know uh, when is the next uh, launch date so I, I could be there? How do I keep track of it? <laughs> That's a tough question. <laughs> <laughs> they, they don't really announce uh, those projects uh, publicly and uh, also depends on the weather they can right. change. Uh, Correct. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. unfortunately, those are not the... <laughs> sure. Also, it's a tra attraction uh, yeah. for the toilets. Correct. So, um, um, what 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 is it like for you uh, to live in the uh, in in Beijing? Uh, I I presume that your family is also with you in Beijing. Right. Yeah. My wife and my daughter, uh, mm. who is uh, now fourteen year old, uh, okay. we are we live in Beijing for about thirteen years now. Wow, that's a long time. Yeah. 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 Okay. As you know, uh, Beijing uh, is a uh, metropolitan yes. uh, with a big population, close to an uh, uh, entire population of Malaysia, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, so, uh, so living in Beijing, uh, before, before we moved to Beijing, we were in Stanford. So the weather is pretty nice in Stanford, all that. Yeah, <laughs> and then when we moved to Beijing, uh, in the first couple of years, uh, from two thousand ten to two thousand fifteen, the air quality was okay until mm. about uh, two thousand fifteen. We had some pollution yeah. issue, the yeah. air pollution, but then it got better. Now it's much better. It's closer to the two thousand ten uh, situation, yeah. or even better. Yeah. And we also have more gardens, uh, okay. parks in uh, Beijing. So we actually quite enjoy the seasonal weather here. Uh, yes. So so beside yourself at the Tsinghua University, are there any Malaysian academics in the same university with you? Yeah, there are, uh, I uh, know another professor, uh, mm. Malaysian professor, young professor, uh, maybe five years younger than me uh, mm. was in the physics department okay uh, yes okay. I'm, I'm always and interested there are many students yeah there are many students Malaysian okay. students about 350 uh, Malaysian students now okay. I think it's the largest foreign uh, student in yes. uh, Tsinghua University now and there are about 1,600 uh, Malaysian students in Beijing alone Mm. So I guess I estimate there might be over ten thousand in China now. Okay. So it's a growing uh, number yeah. now, growing bodies, student body. Uh, quite a number yes. of people are actually very surprised uh, that in this uh, Tsinghua University, uh, they actually postgraduate the studies which is conducted in English, right? Some some disciplines uh, mm. are available in English, but not all. 
I think most of the study uh, or the classes are still uh, taught in Chinese. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, because of the lectures and uh, professor, yeah. they're mostly Chinese. But there are some disciplines that they have uh, uh, the whole English uh, international uh, classes, like architect, like some of the classes in economics, those are uh, international English yeah. class. Yeah. yeah, I believe uh, I think the master's uh, in law is also in English, so there's an option there. Yes, yeah. So, Those professor, disappear. you know that um, for 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 Malaysian, okay, uh, they 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 read uh, a lot about Tsinghua University and Beta Peking University. So everybody uh, feels that well, they aspire, okay, uh, aspire to go into this uh, prestigious uh, university. So how does a Malaysian prepare himself, pre prepare himself or herself to say, okay? I'm aiming these two universities. I'm competing with so many people. So how should they prepare themselves to go into these two universities, either one? Uh, so, of course, the first discipline will be to work hard uh, in uh, in the school. Uh, I would say the high school, right? The uh, high school will be the most important time that the students have to prepare themselves to get mm -hmm. into university. Mm -hmm. And um, I see more and more opportunity for uh, Chinese university, not only Tsinghua or Beida, mm -hmm. at, to accept or welcome international students to come here. Although we know that uh, Tsinghua and Beida has the top resource, top university uh, to our students. But I also would like to uh, suggest that our uh, what I saw in many other uh, good universities in China, their resources have become much better uh, compared to five or 10 years ago. And there are many international programs available. Uh, so even if you are preparing for uh, to come into Tsinghua Beida, but you might also want to look uh, around for other Chinese universities, they have uh, many uh, I think uh, good international competitive levels of uh, education resource, and yet the uh, tuition fee is affordable <laughs> uh, compared to US or other countries. Sure. So yeah. I'll encourage uh, the, our students to uh, look around, not only sure. these two universities. <laughs> So, yes. so, Professor, now um, when, when the Malaysian student uh, applies to go to uh, any of these universities, uh, do they compete with the uh, um, local Chinese student or we just competing with the uh, foreign uh, students for entry? Oh, yeah. Usually it's for only competing with the international student. Okay. Uh, right. They have a different uh, numbers allocating only for uh, international students. And uh, Chinese students have a different categories and numbers that they allocated by the Ministry of Education each year. So, and we know that now uh, all these universities are competing to get the best uh, international student around. And so this is the, I, I guess, uh, from 2010 to now, this is the best time uh, for international student to apply. Uh, because now they have more and more international programs and uh, they are more used to in terms of uh, living stars, living customs, all this, to welcome international students to come here. So, Professor, yes. before we wrap this up, I've got one final question for you. Okay, Now, um, your name was mentioned by the Prime Minister of Malaysia, Dr. Sri Anil Ibrahim, when he visited uh, your campus. He mentioned your name, of course, and everybody in Malaysia started looking for you. And I was quite surprised that in 2017, the star had actually interviewed you. But nevertheless, okay, um, will you be coming back to Malaysia at least to give a lecture soon and we can listen to you in real person to talk about your project and uh, as they said, Bila mau balik kampung. <laughs> yes, I, I love to balik kampung. <laughs> I love to go back. And uh, I, I'm Actually, each year I will go back to Malaysia uh, for Chinese New Year and stay okay. with my uh, parents for a couple of weeks. For example, this year, uh, after this uh, COVID-19 restriction, the mm -hmm. first, uh, after the relief order restriction, I went back immediately in okay. January. 
I stay with my family for about three, uh, about three weeks okay. in Johor Bahru. Okay. So at least once a year, I will go back to Malaysia. I, okay. Hopefully <laughs> in the future, more and more. And uh, if I have the opportunity to uh, sure. uh, to give some uh, lectures or anything good. to help, uh, yes, yes, I would like to do that. Yes. Um, yes. Thank you so much, Professor, for taking time off from your lectures and from your research uh, to share with Malaysians and people from around the world about your research project and what you do down there. So thank you, uh, Professor, for joining us and please stay in touch. Thank you, Malaysians and people from around the world. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.